Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to The Debrief, a weekly Q&A show from Sandals Church and Pastor Matt Brown with tough questions to, wait, real questions. Dang, guys. I was just, okay, I was literally just about ready to compliment you, and I was going to say these words. That's your best intro since I've been back. Yeah. And now I can't say that because it may be your worst. Yeah. You guys didn't stick the landing there, buddy. Everybody say a little prayer for PRD. You know what? I got just a little bit. You you ever been in that situation where you're kind of running just a little bit too fast? (laughs) No. And you know you're about to face plant? No. Okay. I've been been there. And uh, I realized. You've done that? I feel, yeah, I don't like know if I actually, but like, yeah, when, when you're, you're like downhill. running and you're like, oh no, I, I yep. came at this too strong. I did. I came out at it and I think my, my, my tongue, my lips, my whole oral situation was like, uh, a little one too or, far one, ahead. Yeah. One yeah. or two, one or two words ahead of my brain. So mm, it yep. just collapsed. But either way, this is a great podcast, yeah. great show. And we are so glad you're tuned in for it. <laughs> yeah. In case you're wondering, we do real answers to tough questions about the Bible here. That's right. Every single week. So. I'm Justin Party. I'm Stephanie Schaefer. And we are here with the Reverend Pastor. Well, you're not wearing your glasses right no. now. If you had your glasses on, I w- you're Matthew Brown to me when, yes. you, when you have those glasses. I yeah. think it's a more it's more formal, and uh, you definitely look a whole nother level. Yeah, I think our relationship could use a little respect from you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> pro- pro- probably. One of, <laughs> in any one of multiple directions. That's true. That's awesome. All right. Well, right now here on The Debrief, we are going through a bunch of how-to episodes while Sandals Church is going back to school. We are learning how to do all kinds of things here on The Debrief. Last week's episode was all about how to be wise. So if you haven't checked that one out yet, it is incredible. As Pastor Matt kicked off our series on wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be going through a bunch more things on this show. So if you have questions about how to make decisions, maybe how to not suck at relationships, we would love to get those here Mm. on the show so we can learn how to do... Maybe I should send in some questions. (laughs) (laughs) We'll we'll, we'll receive those. I want to start with a question today. Why did you guys get the cool D brief coffee mugs and I got this Batman mug. Have you tried to drink coffee out of this? <laughs> no, I just thought you think it was cool. It is okay, it is cool to look at oh, for mm. our people who are watching. I literally cannot get my do you lips drink over his face you just, around yeah, like, his- Batman's face. Yeah. Handle back there and just no. I, this the is forehead? the worst coffee mug ever. Yeah, I, I was gonna tell our YouTube video listener wa- look, video. Okay. Yeah, to try. <laughs> Even though Pastor Matt looks you're, like a... You're overcoming a really challenging situation yeah. right Please now, Please take him seriously. <laughs> Please take okay, him seriously. Okay, whoever invented this coffee mug, fail. <laughs> Total fail. Yeah. You can't even... Great concept I think this is supposed execution. to be like... It's supposed to go like on your desk. You're not supposed to actually use this. <laughs> mm. I'm drinking out of a skull. It's like weird. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm that sorry. is... Like it, if you, know you guys, for those of you who are watching, look at that. I mean, that's kind of creepy. What if he had his little bat cow ears and they had little sippy holes in them so you could... I think that would probably make it better. Yeah, through the. Totally I'm just gonna enjoy fail. my wonderful debrief yeah, show we'll, mug. We'll drink here. from the debrief mug. Available mugs. at the <laughs> depot location at the right. Church campus. I think my assistant needs a write up for this one. <laughs> okay, I can't let your assistant get that because I was the one that picked that mug out from the kitchen because I thought it would look fun on on YouTube for okay, our friends. Well, guess what? You get to drink out of it next episode. You know, and okay. congratulations to Stephanie for just taking personal responsibility. Yeah, you mm. know, own it. I straight. have been the assistant before, <laughs> and whenever someone can actually own the thing that wasn't my fault, I appreciate mm. it. So. I feel like though, when you were my assistant, a lot of things were your fault. And they were. I learned. I grew. Yeah, that's, you know what? She's pr- picked up some wisdom. And speaking of wisdom, which we talked about last like, week. Like, for we're example, the more. time I went to speak at a revival. Oh, yes. Listen. And someone didn't tell me it was a revival. So Listen. for all of our listeners, I show up to speak at, I think I'm speaking to like 30 leaders. Mm-hmm. And Stephanie set fair, this up. To be fair, I thought you were too. So. I show up. <laughs> there are hundreds of people gathered. It's a rally, potluck. Yep. Mm. Like they've brought, they've hired a band. Oh man, and I'm I'm hours away from Riverside. I don't have my computer. I I'm literally panicking. Got to got to do a bust yeah. out a revival message. Yeah. Oh, to be dude. fair, you hired a girl who didn't grow up in church, didn't know what a revival is. Oh my so. gosh! Thank God somebody <laughs> texted me an old message and I got through it. Whew. If anyone can, it's you. But yeah, ima- like you imagine, ima- so for those of you who don't know what a revival is, imagine you're going to you, you think you're going to speak to like you know, 20 or 30 people and it's Harvest Crusade mm-hmm. hmm, and okay. you're the speaker. Mm-hmm. Now it wasn't Harvest Crusade, but it was, it was a, it was the biggest event this church does all year long. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was the keynote speaker. And you just were rolling up all casual, ready to talk. Hadn't about being real. really thought a bit about, oh my gosh, it was the worst. I had a little panic attack, but we got through it. So yeah. they took me to pyology beforehand and I couldn't even eat my pizza because I was just freaking out. <laughs> That's the real And I was texting thing. like mean text messages to oh, Stephanie, yes. like What? Is happening. It's probably about right. the fifth time I got fired over text message. Mental firing. Mental yeah, firing. Only mental. mental firing. I'm still mm-hmm. here. Still yep. hanging on. 
You got, I would say you got more mental raises than mental terminations. Yeah, and that's why I'm still here. Yep. So and just remember, they balanced out. remember on the day of judgment, there'll be a little cashier's desk over to the yeah. right where you cash in those, those mental, mental raises. raises. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just do what I do when they actually do fire you. You just show up to work the next week and they'll, it just, it just smooths out, just rolls <laughs> over. Next thing you know, you got a podcast and you get to say, well, hey, everybody, every single week. And yeah. it's a good time. So we're going to talk about wisdom today. And yes. speaking sure. of wisdom, I got to share with you guys this incredible five star review, which Whoa. was wisely mm-hmm. left. Uh, she says, always mind blowing. This is from Katie Crowley. Uh, you guys, listen, please pop over to the iTunes store, leave a five star review. It helps people find us on the show. Mm-hmm. Katie says, my husband and I listen to the debrief every week, and we are both amazed with each episode. So are we. Yeah. <laughs> So far, their minds are blown. We learned so many things that just leave our minds blown. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Wow. That must have been a callback in my brain from when I read this earlier. Over the course of the debrief's existence, we have become closer with each other and with God. We find ourselves becoming better and better in every aspect of our lives due to the lessons we have learned. We are both so incredibly thankful for this podcast and for our home church, Sandals itself. Well, thanks, Katie Crowley and your mysterious unnamed husband. Whoa. Mr. Crowley, most likely. You know what? That's a, give that a guess. A real, yeah. Good guess. Good one. Mm. I thought so. Well, let's jump into it. We got all kinds of questions. We're going to be debriefing the sermon today. You talked about how to have wisdom. And then we actually also opened up the sermon uh, over the weekend. A whole bunch of craziness went down in Charlottesville. Mm-hmm. And you actually opened your sermon on Sunday morning, really speaking directly to that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, anytime an event like happens like that, just always pray for me, you know, because wading into these events uh, in modern day America is very, very difficult. And Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what you say, you're going to offend somebody. So just whenever you watch that, just think, oh man, Matt's got to preach this weekend. I'll pray for him. Um, Because, you know, like I said, whenever you wade into it, you end up offending somebody. And so Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I needed to address it a little bit and we were preaching on wisdom. So hopefully I did so wisely. So thank you for uh, all of your grace from our listeners Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and from, you know, the criticism, because it does make me better. So thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. We actually got some questions about yeah, that. Yeah, we did. Uh, what I loved, one of the things that you said in that opening to your sermon was how we should be using love as a weapon against hate. And Leah actually sent in a question and says, in the midst of a political climate of what seems like inaction against vitriol and bigotry, what are some practical steps for using love as a weapon? How do you actually do that? Yeah. So, well, I don't know that I agree with her statement that there's inaction against vitriol and bigotry. So here's part of the problem with the uh, the political climate. Um, I think that uh, you know, I think Donald Trump deserves the vast amount of criticism that he receives. I think his personality is problematic. I pray for him. I support him. Um, you know, I, I just I, I want him to succeed mm-hmm. because I think we all need that. However, uh, in this instance, I think that his criticism is unfair. I mean, when somebody universally denounces bigotry, I think you are hyperventilating uh, negatively, trying to find something to criticize about that. I mean, to me, this is like the birther issue with Obama. I mean, I just felt like those people were ridiculous. You don't like Obama, that's fine. Quit chasing down, you know, the birth certificate issue. It just is asinine. It's stupid. It's unwise. So I think that we, we do live in a climate where we had the president, the leader of the United States of America, universally condemn it in all its forms. And I thought that was a good thing. Uh, he got criticized. Two days later, uh, or a day later, he rallied back and he condemned specifically uh, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, and white supremacy. I can't remember what else was in his list. Uh, And I think that was a good thing that he condemned those things as they should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're despicable, awful, ugly, and terrible. Um, But here's the tragedy in our culture is that Donald Trump has become the focus of this and not these idiots that did what they did, these mm-hmm. evil, loathful people. Instead of about, you know, talking about Donald Trump, why aren't we talking about who the leaders of this is? You know, um, I think, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some more questions and I'll, I'll give some more thoughts on it. But I, I think that these groups, these hate groups need to be treated like the mob. And so here's what I believe. I believe that you can believe whatever you want in the United States of America. I believe you have that freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have the freedom to hate the constitution. You have the freedom to hate the United States. You have sure. the freedom to hate anybody you want. When you become violent, when you cross that line and you begin to intimidate and you you begin to hurt people, man, I think they need to be treated, treated like the mob. They need to be broken up. We need to investigate these groups and these organizations and they need to be taken down because it's, you, you know, you can, you, can, you can think all the evil thoughts that you want. You start threatening people, you start doing hurtful things. Man, that's, that's crossing the line and that is mm-hmm. unacceptable in a free society. Sure. So, um, but in a free society, you get to believe stupid, evil things. 
So you get, you get to do that. Uh, there's a lot of things people believe in America that I believe are evil um, according to scripture and according to God, but people get to believe that in a free society. And I think that that's important that we, you know, we respect people's, um, you know, freedom in our country to believe those things as we want to be respected, to believe what we believe and um, the freedom to worship God as we see fit. So I think that's really, really important. So I, I, I don't think that it's not being dealt with. I think the problem is being dealt with it is, is very, very difficult. Um, and, and I think that we need, we need to do that. There's a heightened sense of awareness uh, of it right now. And I think that, you know, I think our country has made great strides. We are not the same country we have been in the past. Uh, what this country did to black people historically is awful, evil, despicable, terrible, and awful. Um, a lot of those wrongs have been made right. There's still a lot of work to do, but you can't say that we, we were where we were. You, you just, you can't, you can't make that as a reasonable argument. There's still work to do. Um, and let me just say this, racism is not a white problem. It, it, it's, it's a universal human problem. It, it's, it's, it's a problem. Uh, I just got back from Hawaii and on my last day, my last day, I, I ran into a Hawaiian and he threatened me. He wanted to fight physical violence, he used every racial slur you can possibly use against a white person, blamed me for every single thing that's ever gone wrong in the Hawaiian islands and all of human history because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. The only reason he hated me, the only reason he did what he did was because of the color of my skin. And it was, I mean, it was threatening. I mean, I, he was bigger than me uh, and my cousin together. <laughs> it was, it was quite a challenge, um, you know, and, and thank God we were able to evade that without uh, physical, without a physical encounter, because I would have, I would have gotten hurt, really, really hurt. Uh, but the only reason he did that was because of the color of my skin. And so just understand that racism is a problem. And it's just one of those things that comes out of our depravity and our ugliness. And, um, I think that, you know, we need to understand that. And so here's the thing is, um, I don't know if we're gonna get into this, but I, I said this in my sermon, that we are all prisoners to our own experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to say, well, Hawaiians are this or that or that. Well, the truth is the vast majority of Hawaiians are great people, good people, and they recognize the ills that have taken place um, on their island and, and the things that happened in the past. But um, most of them are welcoming, good people, loving people, kind people, and mm -hmm. live in the spirit of aloha. There are some people that just don't, and they're just nasty, mean, ugly, dark, evil people. And, and that's the truth. And so it's dangerous to base and judge all of Hawaiians based upon a few encounters that I've had. And that's not the only encounter I've had over there. I've had, I've had some, some run-ins because racism is alive and is real and is a part of, of the world that we live in. Um, the problem is, is that some ra racism in our culture is justified and others is not. And so we, we need to equally condemn it all. We need, as Christians, we need to stand up for what's right. Um, and what that guy did in Hawaii is not justified. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not, I had nothing to do with who those people are or what happened to him. I mean, I, I, I was not a participant in that in any way, but I was the victim of his hate crime. I was, and that's tragic and wrong. And we need to, so here as Christians, what we need to do is we need to equally uh, put it all down. And so um, we need to stand up against these white racists and, um, we, we need to support the government as they figure out who these people are. And that's one of the downsides of technology is these individuals are able to organize mm -hmm. in ways that w they've never been able to do before because, you know, they're sitting in their shacks wherever they are in, mm -hmm. in, in the South. And now they're able to get on a blog and, you know, the internet, unfortunately, is a great weapon of hate. It, it just mm -hmm. is. And it tends to bring out the worst in all of us, mm -hmm. not just, you know, white supremacist, you know, morons. It tends to bring out the worst of, on all of us. And so, we need to make sure that, that we, we deal with that um, and we need to stand up for that and, and that's wrong. And especially if you call yourself a conservative and you're a Christian, man, you just don't make excuses for it. There's no excuse for it. This stuff needs to be dealt with and um, you just unequivocally con condemn it, which is, is what the president, you know, I think should have done initially, but I'm not going to rip him for, you know, his initial comments because I get ripped all the time for my initial comments and it doesn't always come out the way that you want it. And, and again, um, I think he deserves a lot of criticism for a lot of the stupid things that he says. This is not one of those issues where I, I think we all need to hyperventilate and lose our minds. So I think if you're a, a Republican, a conservative Christian, you need to be quick to condemn these organizations and not make any excuses for it. However, if you are a liberal and you're a liberal Christian, listen, man, there was another group there that's called, uh, I think they're called 
in Infada or Infada. Oh yeah, or, man, that group Antifa. is Antifa. That Antifa. That man, thank you. That group is dangerous, and those people go around to stir up violence. I mean, th- they pee in balloons, they they urinate in balloons, and they <laughs> throw them at people. Th- this is what's happening, and so that group is just as sick on the other side. And um, so I, I think it's important that we address all issues. And I'm not saying that they are equally evil, but they are both evil and, and that's awful and, and should be dealt with. And if you're a liberal person, you need to be deeply concerned about the left movement within your organization because they are dangerous. And um, you know it, it's absolutely frightening. It, it, it's frightening to me what's taking place in our country. And so we can get into you know these statues being torn down. And, and I think that there are, you know, there, there's a reasonable way to deal with that, but um, we need to we need to negotiate this in the future very very carefully mm-hmm. and very very cautiously, um, because there's a sickness on both sides, and um, you know, again, conservatives need to. Uh, they, I mean, these white supremacists don't represent you; they don't represent what you're about, but they are identifying with you, mm-hmm. so they need to be uh, identified and called out and condemned. and uh, And I think President Trump would have been wiser to do that much sooner. And much quicker, um, but uh, you know, I, you know, I, I, I let me let me just say this on the left. I think uh, President Obama's pastor was a racist. I, I just believe that he was in Chicago. And you can listen to his sermons. I think that he was an instigator. He was a hateful person. He said awful, terrible things repeatedly. And again, what we need to do as Christians is call people equally to the issues. And and I don't think that that pastor represented Obama and who he is. I don't I don't believe that. I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. He was that at all, but his pastor, man, that dude was that dude was rough, mm-hmm. absolutely rough and wrong in a lot of ways. And again, you know, racism is not just a white problem; it's it's a human problem, and um, it comes out because of our sin. And so, we need to to deal with that, and we need to stand against it in all its forms. Um, you know, segregation is a sinful issue, and that's why we don't call our church segregation; we call it a congregation. We congregate together according to the gospel. Um, we should congregate with all races because our blood uh, that unites us is not the blood of our ancestry or of our race, but the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that brings us together. And unfortunately, you know, the church has not been responsive in that way. And, and I would say this because the church historically in America has been far more American than it has been Christian. And that is a problem. And so I, that's why I said this weekend, we are more divine, the more diverse we become. And I, I think that's important. Look at... Um, the, the kingdom of God, the new heaven and the new earth. It specifically states people of all nations. It means black people, white people. It means Hispanics. It means, I mean, people from every race, every tribe, every tongue, mm-hmm. every tongue, every tongue <laughs> maintain their ethnicity mm-hmm. in the new kingdom. And, and that's because God loves that and yeah. he blesses that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's important. Um, you know, so Jesus makes the case that marriage isn't going to make the next level, but, but, uh, Ethnicity and race does. Mm -hmm. And that's because God loves, you know, all races, all ethnicities. And in these individuals that, that divide human beings by pigmentation, it's just, it's just such Mm -hmm. a horrific, terrible thing. So, so I would say, so let's go back to our question. How do we wade into this? I I think with reason, you know, is this reasonable? You know, I think much of the media is fanatical. I think there's a passionate hate for Donald Trump. Some of it's deserved. The, the guy could really, really work on how he says a lot of things. And that's just, that's just the truth. And, and if you support him, if you're reasonable, you have to acknowledge that. You have to acknowledge the guy needs to work on, on what he says and how he says it. And that's, that's important. And I would say that all the time as Christians, it's not just important what we say, but how we say it. I mean, there's a way that you can share the gospel that's offensive. And there's a way that you can share the gospel that's inviting. And so I think you need to be reasonable and just know that if you lean left or you lean right, you got to check yourself and ask yourself, am I being, being carried by emotion or am I being carried by wisdom? So here's the good news. There's two special investigations that have been set, uh, one by the Department of Justice and the other by the FBI looking into that. I think that's a good thing. It's an immediate thing. Um, this young man, this 21-year-old who did what he did and took the life of someone else, you know, he needs to be held accountable in a court of law immediately. Mm-hmm. And the good news is that's, that's happening. Um, but I think there needs to be a greater investigation into how these orga- organizations are organized and they need to be dealt with as terrorist organizations and hate groups. And I absolutely support that as we all should, but we need to rally against hate on the left and on the right. And we need to stand uh, against that because um, 
it's, it's just, it's just something that's really, really important to do. So, okay. So did I answer yeah. all of her stuff? Well, the, the closing line of her question was really, what are some practical steps for using love as a weapon? Cause you mentioned that this weekend that when we're, we see hate, when we see those waters starting to swirl, that our response to hate should be love. Well, How do we I, do yeah, that practically? I, I, one of my, man, one of the pastors that I follow on Instagram, his initial response is I hate all of this. That's a date, man. That is a dangerous thing to express. Um, what mo- what motivates us should be love and our heart should be, man, I, let me tell you wh- what I felt. I felt deep sadness. Mm-hmm. I, I just felt deep, deep sadness that this is, this is still something that we're struggling with that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so here's the good news in all of this. It reminds us of the human condition. We need to be saved. We, th- this whole idea that, oh, we're all good people and we're all kind of going to, man, no, this reminds you there is real evil in the world There is real ugliness and there's real sin that needs to be dealt with. Now, it may not be your sin, but it was this, it was these people's sins. I mean, you know, these individuals marching with their torches and, and, you know, saluting to, you know, Hitler, who here's the thing that's ironic is most of these guys would have been killed by Hitler. I mean, if you, if you study um, the history of the movement, man, there were German soldiers that killed themselves because you know what happened? They realized they had uh, Jewish lineage in their history. Hmm. And so here they are supporting this guy. And then all of a sudden, oh man, there's no future for me in this. And, and so a lot of these individuals, man, you don't understand. I mean, Hitler killed not just Jews. Uh, he starved out the Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. Uh, he hated Russians. Uh, man, he hated lots of groups and lots of individuals. The Jews were at the forefront, but man, hatred loves to hate. That's what it sure. does. And it grows and it manifests and, and it doesn't stop. And so, you know, a lot of these individuals would have been killed by Hitler. And that's just you know, it shows their stupidity and their ignorance because they don't even know their own DNA history. So um, it's just sad, stupid, and whatever. And so I think what we need to do is we need we need to ask this question, what would love do? Right. Now, sometimes love marches. Sometimes love has to take a stand. Sometimes, you know, if, if I love my family, what that means if somebody breaks into my house, yeah, I may have to get violent to protect my family. But what must, what's motivating me is not the hatred of the person that comes into my home, but the love for my wife and kids. Mm-hmm. And so you just have to ask yourself, am I being motivated by love? Um, because that's what motivates and drives God. It's not hatred, it's love. That's what motivated and drove Jesus. And uh, we just have to make ourselves. And I, so I think the practical step is to take a step back and ask myself, am I being carried away by my emotion? Which, where's that gonna take me? It's gonna take me to hatred. I mean, it just is. It's, that's, my, that's the human default is hatred. Right. So the God default is love. And to say, okay, we're all gonna react to this. So Bob Goff in his book, Love Does, says this. He says, be a beautiful reaction. So how do I react to this in love? Um, You know, um, part of that, if you're on the left, is there needs to be a movement that's different from these individuals that are going everywhere and protesting and destroying things and burning things and setting things on fire and really causing problems. There needs to be peaceful demonstrations uh, that peacefully resist. Um, because I think it would have been far more powerful for there to have been a peaceful rally that showed the contrast between, you know, those protesting and, and those marching. And yeah. unfortunately it, it got a little, it got a little muddy and, and it got violent. And that does not to condemn all the protesters. I, I heard that, I, and I don't know this to be true or not, but what I heard today is the young woman that was killed was not a part of, um, some of the crazy militant groups, but was a peaceful protester. And ultimately she, she lost her life. And, and you need to think about that. Those of you who are getting ready to run down and protest, you know, idiots love a crowd. They, they're drawn to a crowd. Riots are always very, very dangerous uh, places. And so um, I think, unfortunately, one of the things we need to look at is, you know, the police response to this. And I'm a big, I'm a big police supporter, but they were not prepared mm-hmm. for that. And I, I don't know why that needs to be part of the investigation. Why weren't we more prepared? When the KKK comes to town, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to assume things could get ugly really, really quick. And so you need a massive presence and a massive force to make sure that innocent people are protected because somebody lost their life. And that's absolutely terrible. I mean, we go to great lengths at all of our meetings and events to make sure that we have security because we want to protect people because it just takes one idiot. Mm -hmm. It takes Mm -hmm. one idiot to uh, just wreak havoc and harm for people. So here's my one piece of advice. Step back. Don't give into your emotions, but ask, okay, Say, God, I need wisdom in this area. How should I act? And I'm not gonna tell everybody how to act in every situation um, because I don't know what it's like to be a black person looking at this. I don't know what it's like to be a Latino person looking at this. Newsflash, I don't even know what it's like for all white people looking at this. 
I am a prisoner to my own experience. And so I have to say, I have to take responsibility for me and I have to say, okay, Matt Brown, don't get caught up in the emotion of the event, but ask yourself, what would love do? How do you respond to this? And by the way, love is not weak. So the part of the reason some people would say, well, you know, I don't believe that we were super, I believe that love is the most powerful weapon on earth Mm -hmm. and it brings the most change. Um, The greatest movements have been movements of love. I mean, there's a reason, you know, we have Martin Luther King Day in this country. He's one of the greatest leaders in the history of our country. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I would put him second only to Abraham Lincoln. And that's my opinion. That's not any like poll or anything. (laughs) But in my opinion, he's the second greatest leader this country has ever produced. I think Abraham Lincoln was the greatest. And um, I I mean, he just, he deserves a holiday for for the rest of our country's history. He's just an amazing, amazing guy who spoke, I think, to who we are supposed to be. Not to who we are, but to who we're supposed to be. And I think that's what God does. That's what love does. Love doesn't speak to our hate. It speaks to the love that's inside of each and every one of us and wants to come out and it compels us. And ultimately Martin Luther King convicted white people in this country of what was right, Mm -hmm. of what was morally right. And so what needed a change in this country was how white people perceive black people. And, you know, that's why we still listen to his speeches and we still listen to his words. And man, the guy, the guy's dead, but his message lives on Mm -hmm. and it's powerful and it's convicting. And, um, so we need to ask ourselves to do that. And specifically before you Facebook and don't respond to every idiot. Just don't, you know, I, I think we all feel like we need to set people straight and just, just don't, mm-hmm. you know, um, I can't tell you how many emails I've deleted, how many comments <laughs> I've deleted and I've never regretted it. I've never, I've never regretted. You know, I should have sent that. I, what, here's what I regret. I regret sending them. Mm. So true. You know, mm-hmm. because if you're a Christian, that then is out there forever. Mm-hmm. Your worst moment, your most emotional moment is now out there forever. I keep telling my kids this, you know, social media, I'm so grateful that when I was a young idiot, not everything was out there forever. You know, my stupid mm. moments came and went by the grace of God. Nowadays, there's permanence to it. There's absolute permanence. You know, I said something uh, a couple of years ago um, on the gay marriage issue, and I wish I never would have said it. I wish I never would have said it because it was taken out of context. It was, it was, it was twisted. And, uh, I, but you know what? I can never get that back. Yeah. I'm never getting that back. Even though I regret it, even though I'm sorry for it, even though I don't, I don't, I didn't even know I said it. So until somebody showed it to me, so (laughs) that's always nice. But so that's what I would say. Take responsibility for you. If you want, if you want to give in to hate, try to take responsibility for everybody else. Try to parent America. There's 320 million people. If you try to do that, you're going to be mad. Mm. You just can't. I have a hard enough time managing myself. So truth. Okay, let's let's. Wow, let's, that was like a 20 minute answer to her. A, I think that was also. a 20 minute question. I think that, yeah. that was good. Yeah. Okay, we're going to look at just wisdom more generally. Mm-hmm. This was week two of our back to school series. You were talking about learning to be wise. That was the mm-hmm. message there. And Tyler wrote in says, every time I take a spiritual gifts test. Wisdom is one of my results. I know that wisdom is something that I want and need to pursue. So what does it mean to have the gift of wisdom in the first place? Yeah, the first thing I would do if you want to be more wise is stop taking spiritual gifts tests. That's the first thing. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say yeah, that. I'm not a big fan of those. Um, as human beings, we are not great assessors of our own gifts. We just we just aren't. You know, People uh, try out for the worship team all the time because they think they can sing. Mm-hmm. And they can't. I mean, that is... Lord, I lift your name yeah, on Yeah, high. exactly. Came great, point. great. You know, um, I mean, people- came from my heart. Yeah, well, it did, but it didn't come from your talent. So, um, <laughs> and that's okay. You know, I'm not on the worship team and I'm not going to be on the worship team. And so, you know, people, we're just not great self-assessors. We all have blind spots. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, we, we talked about our president a little bit. I think he has some real blind spots between how he sees himself and how people see him. I, I, I think there is a huge gap there. And it's just a great example. And that guy's got a lot of resources, but doesn't be but doesn't seem to be able to see himself. And and I think we all struggle with that. And that's why we need community and we need people to speak into our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have young pastors all the time who tell me, yeah, I have the gift of teaching and preaching. And I say, well, how many people listen to you? And they say, none. Then you don't have the gift of preaching and teaching. You mm-hmm. don't have the gift of leadership if no one is following you. Right. So, um, the way that we experience our giftedness is in community. And that's the way God has designed that. So, um, so the first thing I would do is, is I would, if I, if I think I have the gift of wisdom, I I would look, 
you know, are other people asking you for advice? Are other people asking for your input? Are other people listening to your direction, right? That's or even when, just looking at your life and wanting to emulate yeah, you. That's when you know you have the spiritual gift of wisdom. Um, are there repeated incidences where everybody else makes bad decisions and you don't, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that that's that's when you know, okay, God has given me a supernatural gift to go against the current of culture and I make a different decision because of my intuition or the spirit of God that's inside of me, or there's something inside of me that's saying, I shouldn't be doing this, or this is not right. That's when you know you have the spirit of the, the gift of wisdom. And and it's not it's not a uh, super, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's the, the, the gift's not everywhere. Not a lot of people have the spiritual gift of right. wisdom. Mm-hmm. So uh, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't call it wisdom, we'd call it normal. So, um, so read me the question again. Um, just every time I take a gift test, wisdom is one of my results. What does it mean to have the gift of wisdom? Or I think even just the question is, can some people be gifted with wisdom? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So some people can have extraordinary gifts of wisdom. And and just because two people have the gift of wisdom, it doesn't mean they have the equal gift of wisdom. Um, you know, there, there are people that are, are more wise based upon their experiences, based upon, um, their study, their work, you know? So remember this weekend that wisdom is the pursuit of moral strength and mental skill. And so, Wisdom is one of those gifts, like all spiritual gifts, when they're practiced, when they're used, uh, they grow. I mean, God gives gifts to grow and that's why he gives them to us. And so just like I have the gift of public speaking and preaching, God has grown that gift over the years as I have worked at it and refined it and listened to criticism, pursued you know, my own education and my own knowledge. God has allowed me to become a better communicator. Am, have I reached the pinnacle of my communication skills? I hope not. I hope I will continue to grow. And I hope that as I age, God will continue to refine that and, and, and make it just better. So, so yes, you, you, may have, you may have the gift of wisdom. Uh, I would not um, you know, go with what a spiritual gifts test. We had a guy in our church, he took a spiritual gifts test. I think the, the spiritual gifts said that there were 24 possible gifts. And he told me, he says, I have them all. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're your own church. Wow. Yeah, which proves he doesn't have wisdom. So, I mean, nobody has all the gifts. I mean, why would God do that? We we, we need each other. We need to be in group together. And so, um, you know, w- wisdom is a great gift. It's an important gift. Um, if you don't have the spiritual gift of wisdom, and again, doesn't mean that you you don't have it, but the spiritual gift of wisdom is extraordinary wisdom. It's something that's supernatural uh, in its content and in its delivery, where you just look at somebody and you go, that person is wise. And it doesn't usually accompany education, mm-hmm. right? So someone can you know, be brilliant in the classroom and be very, very unwise. And so you can't confuse wisdom with intelligence mm-hmm. um, because we see every single day, you know, brilliant people make very, very unwise decisions. So wisdom is being able to guard against emotion, right? So we can be intelligent and, and our emotions can override our intelligence. Wisdom allows me to, nope, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to evaluate this situation. I'm not gonna get caught up in this um, because God's telling me to do something different. So, um, and again, what's the beginning of wisdom we talked about this week? Fearing God, listening to him, listening to his commands, listening to his truth, obeying him, fearing him, and that's important. Mm-hmm. So if somebody feels they have wisdom to offer in a particular situation or conversation that would benefit, but doesn't think the audience would listen, is it wrong not to share? What do you think? Mm, probably. Yeah, right. So so part of wisdom is knowing when to speak up. Mm-hmm. So a person that always has to give advice is not wise. That's actually a fool. Hold on, say that again. A person who always has to give advice is not wise. They're just not. Yeah, that's so good. So wisdom is the ability to shut up and just be quiet. And just, you know, this is this is... You know, this is pointless. There's no point. A fool argues with a fool. A wise person lets the fool's lips flap, right? I'm going to tweet myself. I was like, was that a proverb? Yeah, no, that's a Matt Brown verb. So that's what it was. So, um, you know, again, here's, here, here's when I give wisdom, when people ask. Mm-hmm. When people ask. If not, I'm wasting my time. Yeah. Pastor Matt, what should I do? And I don't give wisdom to people who don't listen. So if you come to me and you ask for advice and you don't listen, I'm not going to give you advice again because wise people don't waste their time. I only have so much time and I would rather spend it dispensing it on people who want to listen, who want to grow and who want to change. Fools try to lead fools. Wise people look for people who want instruction. Okay, do you, do you wanna know how to fix your marriage? Do you wanna know how to fix your finances? Do you wanna know how to, to be saved? I, when somebody comes up to me and says, can you tell me how to be saved? Well, yes, 
Yes. But I'm not going to argue with the atheist. I'm just not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to love the atheist. I'm going to pray for the atheist, but I am not going to argue with the atheist. And there are some people that have the spiritual gifts of apologetics and they love to do that. That's not my thing. You know, I, I just I just don't think a lot of people are one to the Lord through arguments. I think people are one to the Lord through loving them. And when they come to the point in their life where they realize they need God, that's when people are ready to change. Mm -hmm. When people have come to the end of themselves, they're ready to begin a relationship with God. So, you know, just yesterday I, I was having a conversation with somebody here on staff and, I, and it was going great. And then halfway through, I realized, I think I'm kind of flapping my jaw about my own self a little too loosely here. And I, I kind of realized, I think I'm speaking foolishly. And one of the things that clued me into that was just the, this person's silence for the last 90 to 120 seconds. Yeah. And uh, you've grown in that area though. You've grown mm -hmm. in reading people. What, yeah. Th and th so a lot of interpersonal skill is the ability to read nonverbal mm -hmm. cues. Right. And some people can't read it. Well, I, I, what I think, ha I think in this instance, um, the th this person I was chatting with wasn't didn't really challenge me on that foolishness because they knew that I needed to discover that for myself. Yeah, talk yourself into obedience. <laughs> right, essentially, yeah, yeah. I've been there, man, mm -hmm. I've been there. So my, if, if, you, if you're like Party and I, you, you flap your lips. So my wife's been a great partner in that. So we just have this thing where under the table, she just puts her hand on my knee and that means shut up. That's enough. Yeah, you've said <laughs> enough. So it's been really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Sometimes it throws me off though, if she like just wants to like, just squeeze me in love and I'm like, oh, she wants me to shut up. Yeah, like, now you're just being much. quiet. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably, that's probably good for the long run. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I loved what you said in your sermon this weekend about, and you just, I think, referenced that right now too, that wisdom will present facts and not feelings. That wisdom is choosing to look at the facts, not our feelings. As someone who tends to be overwhelmed by feelings at some times, what's a good way to start to make a point to pursue and find facts in the midst of, you know, being overwhelmed by feelings, maybe even for people who are responding to, you know, all the things that happened this weekend, which is really emotionally driven stuff. How do you kind of put those aside for a second and pursue the facts instead? How do yeah, you learn to so, train so the problem is right now with our media situation, the facts are really hard to find. I mean, uh, it's, it's just really, really difficult. Um, um, you know, um, so you, you just have to, you just have to know that, that, you know, I, and I pray, I pray for the media in our country on, on the left and on the right, that they would, they, they would actually start reporting the news. And that would be really, really helpful for both sides. Um, you know, I don't think we should be a fan or a hater of Donald Trump. I think we should be lovers of what's right. That's that's mm -hmm. what I that's what I believe. I think that's what our country needs. Um, and and I said the exact same thing. We didn't have the debrief during the o Obama era, but I believe that when he was president, I, I believe that people fanatically hated him, which was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous and inexcusable. And um, so we just have to know that we're all caught up in our feelings and our emotions. And here's the thing: when emotions catch you, it's it's hard to get out of them. You, you just got to know that. So you, you, it's just, you just have to become really, really aware. You have to learn to read yourself. I think that's one of the things that wisdom teaches is wisdom teaches us to um, read ourselves. So when am I more likely to give into emotion when I haven't slept, when I'm tired, when I'm grumpy, when I'm stressed, like these things bring out uh, emotions in me that, you know, I'm not probably going to be super emotional if I've just been on vacation for a week sitting on the beach. I'm going to be able to handle things. And mm -hmm. again, that's why you need to take rest. That's why you need to go to church. So I think you just need to understand we are all given to emotions. So here's what the psychological research shows. There are no decisions that humans make that are free from emotion. Mm -hmm. So even like the nerdiest nerd guy you know, or gal you know, right? We are all driven by emotions. We're emotional creatures. Why? Because we were made by a relational God. And one of the ways that we connect relationally is with emotion. Mm -hmm. Without emotion, we can't connect. So we, we need this. So we just need to understand that, okay, my emotions can cloud the truth. My feelings can hide the facts. And so just be willing to address the facts. Be, be willing to look at things. So, so many, many people feel like uh, race relations are getting worse. Okay, here's the data. And this was on CNN, a left news organization. The data shows from 1996, hate crimes, racial hate crimes, are going down at an all time low. So for the last 15 years, it's going down, it's not going up. So that's good news. Now, does that mean that things aren't still a problem, that there isn't room to grow? No, there's room to grow, but the facts say things are getting better. Uh, more and more people are recognizing in the United States of America that judging people by the color of their skin is wrong. Hating people for the color of their skin is wrong. That's good news, mm -hmm. that's good news. Now, events like this show us that they're still idiots. Right, and uh, they've connected together on Facebook, and so 
Um, this happens to me all the time. Sometimes I feel like everybody hates me because I get a couple of emails and you guys have seen some of my haters mm -hmm. on the internet recently. And I've actually had to have these conversations. Do I want to sue this person in the court of law? Mm -hmm. Because this person is coming after me so bad. And, and the truth is, while it feels like a lot of people hate me, the truth is it's one or two. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe more than that. But, <laughs> but you know no, what happens? it's just one or two. But negativity, n negative people make things feel bigger than they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's the truth. There's a lot of people at Sandals Church that love me. They show up every single week. They, they participate. They serve. And so even I, as a person who's counseling everybody, you know, it's really easy to counsel someone else to listen to the facts when it's their feelings that are hurt. When it's yourself, it's really, really hard to listen to the facts yeah. when it's your feelings. So the truth is the facts show that our country is getting better and healthier on the area of race. The truth is we still need to grow. And some of us have been deeply impacted by the recent events. And so, right, we're emotional people. And, and man, if you, if you don't look at these events this weekend and you don't feel something negative, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Like your heart is callous. True. Like, so I, I don't think that you shouldn't feel bad or feel sad or, or even feel angry. I, I think that momentary angry is okay. Remember, anger spoils. It's like milk. You can't let it sit because it's going to lead you to do something very, very bad um, and, and very, very awful, right? And, 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 and tragic and, and terrible. And so we see people that, that give into these emotions and these feelings, and then they just do horrific things. And, um, you know, like for example, that young man that ran over that crowd of people, do you think he was going with his feelings or facts? What do oh, you yeah. think was driving that car? Yeah, I guarantee good. you it was his feelings. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to learn to do is um, we have to learn to speak against that. And, you know, somebody lost their life, people will be injured forever. And that guy's justifiably so gonna sit in prison for the rest of his life. Yeah, I mean, justifiably so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, I mean, I, don't, I was going to comment on the death penalty. I knew but you were. I, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> hey, wisdom. Yeah. See, I just exercise wisdom. So, because <laughs> yeah, I was going to share my feelings, but mm -hmm. we're not going to do that. So, um, but you know, we, we, we all have to learn to do that. And, and so as human beings, when feelings are in the driver's seat, it's, it's typically not a good thing. So if you're a Christian, let faith, you know, uh, what's that old country song? Jesus, take the wheel. You know, let my faith take You're the tempting wheel. me to sing again. You're tempting yeah, me to sing Yeah, don't do it. Don't yeah, do it. Yeah, use some wisdom. Uh, yeah. Right. So let's go back. So two weeks ago, we talked about Abigail. Mm -hmm. So here at this campus or here at Sandals, you know, we didn't go through the whole story, but ultimately David decides he's going to kill Nabal and, because he's been insulted. Mm -hmm. His feelings have been hurt and he's been wounded. And he's he, literally, he is going to kill every single man, potentially woman and child. I mean, he doesn't know, right? Because once you, once you open up Pandora's box to your rage, yeah. man, things happen that, that, man, you can't take back. And so Abigail meets him and begs him to not do that. And, and he chooses his faith over his feelings. And he says, thank you for coming out to confront me because I would have done a great evil. Mm. I would have done a great evil. He, if had he given into his emotions, mm -hmm. he would have you know, killed Nabal and all his men. So here's the good news of that story. God kills Nabal anyways. 10 days later, God kills him, strikes him dead. Good news. <laughs> so so just, just know this, man. Racists, bigots, neo-Nazis, white supremacists will all be dealt with on the day of Christ. Mm -hmm. No one hates racism more than Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and why? Because he loves us. He loves us. And he loathes people that hate his children. So understand this. Those people are going to stand before an angry God, an angry God. And it, it, man, it's, it's going to be difficult. And so, um, you know, but again, you know, that's why, that's why I think church is so important. You know, I sat back and I thought this weekend, why, why, do these, why are these people so racist? You know, so racism, I think, um, mm. this is actually the thing that God woke me up last night with. Okay. I told you I didn't write down, yes. so I may not get it right, but God woke me up last night and really, really challenged me that racism is really the product of a couple of things. Number one, it's environment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, racism is not caught, it's taught. Somebody mm. teaches you to hate. Mm. Um, the next is it's, it's a product of experience. Something happened, uh, you, you've encountered something, something's been been done to you. So it, it's your experience. And the other thing is it's, it's socioeconomic. Poor people uh, tend to be more racist because it's just, it's, it's, just, it's just one of those things. And then education level. Mm -hmm. And then the huge one is your faith. Does your religion speak against it? And so th those five factors, I think really, really play into, I can't believe that I just remembered that right now. That was crazy. Mm. So those are the things that really, really play into that. And so, you know, I think we need to educate people, um, you know, we need to, the Bible says, love our enemies as ourself. You know, that may include racists. 
I mean, it probably does, right? They're, they're the lowest of the low. So what is happening in their life? What is going on in a person's life where the thing that drives them is the hatred of someone else because of the color of their skin? Man, I don't know, but I, I'm guessing their life isn't good. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing some, some horrific things have happened to make you that hateful, mm-hmm. to, to allow you to give in to the devil's leverage in your life where, like, think about what you want to do on a Saturday is wear, you know, a wizard costume and march out in public and raise your hand to one of the most evil person in, in the history of the world, which is, that's an accomplishment, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the Hitler is in that group. Mm-hmm. Man, what's going on? What's happening in these people's lives? It's just, it's dark. Mm-hmm. It's dark. And so, and that's where as Christians, I, so she asked, what do we do? We got to pray for them because really what needs to happen is we need angelic weapons. Hmm. The only thing that defeats demons is angels, man, God's power. And we need God's power in these people's lives to wake them up um, and to understand their hate and the depths of their depravity. And the good news is we know a savior that can change, you know, not just people's lives, but people's worldview you know, can, t- can take a racist and turn him or her into a righteous person to see the error of their ways and the evil of their heart. And because um, uh, throwing people in prison doesn't change hearts. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't. No. And uh, we, we want to be in the business of changing hearts because what, think about what a powerful weapon for good a converted racist could be. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about that, man. I mean, that's just, that, that's, that's what God does. He takes beauty from ashes. And, uh, and so we need, to, we need to pray deeply into this mm-hmm. because racism, you know, the neo-Nazis, th- this, is, this is like the, the gutter of evil. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, this is the lowest of the low and, and, and the most awful of, of the awful. And, and we need to just hand that over to God and ask God to change hearts. And that doesn't mean yeah. that we don't pursue justice. It doesn't mean that we don't throw people in prison. I mean, I'm, I'm all for those things yeah. um, mm-hmm. because some people are not going to be converted. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. all right, well. I actually saw a really interesting article this morning that was um, an article about like a reformed, um, you know, what do you call it, white nationalist mm. who basically said, you know, he's like, I noticed that people become radicalized because pe- they're looking for the same thing everyone is. They want identity, they want community, and they want a sense of purpose. And so even those like things that God's built into us have clearly just become tweaked in mm. people who are joining these radicalized movements because it's giving them identity and community. Yeah, and that breaks my heart because, yeah. you know, that's a failure of the church. That's on us yeah. is mm-hmm. that we didn't reach out to these young men. We didn't. And it's tough, man, because a lot of these young men are tough. They don't have dads. They grow up in, mm-hmm. uh, and let's just be honest, a lot of these neo-Nazi movements, I don't know, there's one that they're dealing with in Los Angeles, they're drug houses. They're dealing meth. They're, they're doing, you know, they're, they're not out selling cookies, okay? <laughs> these, yeah. these people are not nice people, you know? I mean, it's, it's, there, there's darkness attracts darkness. That's what mm-hmm. it does. And so a lot of these young men are growing up in these horrible, abusive, drug-induced, crime-ridden environments. And um, it's just, it's just, it's just tragically evil. And uh, wow, I got to read that article. You got to send that to me. Yeah, I will. Okay, let me ans- ask this question. Henry wrote in, because a lot of what we're doing for the Back to School series is really looking at wisdom from the Proverbs. He has kind of a long question. Let me ask the first part of it really quick. How should we understand the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Like, what, what are these? They're a bunch of short statements, right? What's yeah, a proverb? so the best way to understand a proverb is that it's a general truth. Okay. And, and this is why it's important because it's not always true, right? They're general truths. So like you can live these Proverbs and still have a difficult life. Mm-hmm. So, so what, what they are is they're general truths that if you live this way, typically you will be better for it. Okay. Because so what well, you can't read these things is say, well, I did all these things. I live all these ways and something bad still happened to me. yes. Man, the sun shines, according to the Bible, on the just and the unjust. These are generalized principles of living that if you do this, you will be better. Okay. So that's the best way to understand a proverb. It's a short teaching that teaches a generalized truth. Okay. And so um, what I would say is it's wisdom for most situations. Okay. So, so understand that, that you, you can't take this bullet and say that if I do this every time, that what I'm going to get back is this every time. Right. Um, because man, it, life happens. So, right. so we, we can only control our part, right? There's another part of life that's outside of our control. So these are general truths. These are principles of wisdom that should guide you through life. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's how we need to understand wisdom. And so he's trying to teach you general principles of moral strength and mental skill. So he's trying to teach us how to think through situations and how to behave morally. And he's gonna address you know, issues that young men deal with, their temper, laziness, sex, and money. 
Those are, those are the, the issues that, and those are the things that we're going to talk about. And think about it. Here we are 3,000 years later and what are young people still struggling with, <laughs> yes, right? Yes. Their, their ambition, their lust, their laziness. I mean, you know, if you're a millennial, this is a great book to read, man. Well, I mean, sure. it's written directly to you. Well, let me, so. let me go with the rest. Of, here's Henry's question. It says, so much of Proverbs is great advice, but in many ways it boils down to a list of do's and don'ts reinforced with a good old, quote unquote, fear God. It sounds like a lot of moralism or legalism and can be pretty discouraging. How does a Christian in light of grace and what Jesus did on the cross understand these things? Listen, grace saves you from the wrath of God. It doesn't save you from the life you live. That was huge. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So grace saves you from the wrath of God, not from the life you live. Proverbs is trying to save you from the life that you're going to live. Uh, okay. Don't live a stupid life, my son. Don't. Listen to your mother. Listen to me as your dad. We love you. We care for you. Here's the things that we've learned. So we haven't, we're going to get into Ecclesiastes. Uh, this next weekend's Teacher Appreciation mm-hmm. Weekend, right? Mm-hmm. So we're going to get into Ecclesiastes a little bit this weekend. And so Ecclesiastes is this whole book about the madness of life and the meaningless of life. And then it ends with these words, fear the Lord and do his will. Fear God and be obedient. I mean, that's how, that's his mm-hmm. summary. And so, so you can, you can summarize, you don't even have to read the whole book of Ecclesiastes. Just read like the last four verses mm-hmm. and you got it. You got it. And so, so what, you know, a lot of do's and don'ts. I think we need some do's and don'ts. Yeah. Not for how to be saved, but for how to live. And so that's the difference. What, what, what the Old Testament believed that was wrong is that we are saved by what we do and what we don't do. That's not true. We are saved, according to the New Testament, but by Christ. However, in life, are you going to live a better life and a longer life if you're not stupid? Yes. <laughs> you're going to live a better, longer, more, more blessed, easier life if you listen to these principles. I mean, think about this just one principle that we've talked about today. Are you going to live a better life if you listen to your emotion or if you listen to reason? Mm-hmm. Like, like right there, that's going to, that's going to navigate you in every area of your life. Every single area of your life will be better if you can think about it. (laughs) No, I'm going to go with my feelings. I'm going to pursue this, right? I'm going to go with my passions. Okay. Following your passions leads to prison. (laughs) It does. That's why, right? That's that's what happens. That's 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 what happens. You follow your passions, Mm -hmm. you go to prison. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn to reason and to think. Okay. You've got to learn to think. And so uh, this is what, why it's such a tragedy that so many young people hate school today because the primary purpose of school is to teach you to think. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to live your own life. You're going to have to make your own decisions. And, and I really wish education could just clear the air and say, we, we need to teach kids how to think. That's it. If, if, if you have a person who can think at 18, you've done well done. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. care if they know algebra. Can they think? Yep. Can they think? Yeah. Now they need to know algebra if they go into some sciences, <laughs> but right. Um, you need to be able to think. You need to be able to be reasonable for relationships, mm-hmm. for your finances, for your health. I mean, I mean, think about it. reason helps obesity. If you can reason through something. So, I mean, obesity is affected by emotions. Well, I feel like I need to eat. I feel like I need to have this. This makes me happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's going to kill you. Mm-hmm. It's going to kill you. But I love Twinkies, but they don't love you. <laughs> okay. They don't. I'm sorry. I looked at you when I said it's that. It's fair. It's but, fine. Do you love it's Twinkies? part of the Holy Spirit. No, I like higher quality junk foods. Oh, mm. like? Mm, just like nice homemade stuff with mm. lots of sugar. I don't okay. like thick. I respect that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Twinkies will survive the rapture, man. I mean, I know, that scares me. Yeah, it's yeah. bad news. So, so okay. So I, I think that there's an overly negative view of the Old Testament, right? So, you know, a lot of people don't believe that you, you, that you should tithe. I think it's wise to tithe. Mm-hmm. It's wise. If you don't know what tithing is, it's giving 10% of your income. Listen to me. I'll, I'll put my finances up against anybody's finances in our church for the last 20 years. I've been tithing to this church for 20 years. I've been intentionally living on 90% or less of my income for 20 years. My wife and I are almost completely debt-free and we are financially better off than almost every friend we have our age. And we lived off less. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I had to tithe? No, because tithing is wise. Mm-hmm. It's wise. Mm-hmm. Anything that God recommends is wise. And all these people that say, oh, I think that's Old Testament or whatever. Okay, maybe it's your emotions. You don't feel like living off less. But when you live off less and you live off more of God, what do you get? Not less, you get more. Mm -hmm. And that's the teaching of scripture. And so, you know, a lot of these people are very, very anti-Old Testament. Listen to me, it takes two 
sections of the Bible to walk out your faith, the old and the new, your left and your right foot. And I've said this before in the debrief, if you only live in one section, you're one-legged and you're gonna fall. That's what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And so none of us should put down or minimize the fear of God. I think in, in years past and in history past, people have overly feared God and not understood the love of God. Nowadays, I think we overly understand the love of God and not the fear of God. Mm -hmm. I want my kids to love me and I want them to know that I love them. They also better be a little afraid of me. And not like in an abusive, mm -hmm. you know, way, but I'm telling you, my kids know when dad is serious, man, it, man, it is on. Yeah. And they know. They talk, yeah. they talk about my, my, my eyes scare them to death because I'm intense. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when, I, when, I, when I'm in your face, I'm looking oh, yeah. at you mm -hmm. and I am super <laughs> intense. But my kids, my kids have a healthy respect and awe for me and they need to. I'm their father and I represent their father in heaven on earth. They need to have that. Um, and a lot of Christians don't have that for God. Again, God's not your father. He's your grandpa. He's some old dude that just wants you to have fun. Okay, you know, listen, that's not what God wants. God wants you to do what's right, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what does the Old Testament say? What does God want us to do according to Micah? To love justice, to walk humbly, right? And love mercy. That's, that's, that's what God wants us to do. So there are some do's. Mm -hmm. So we, we are not saved by effort. We're saved by grace, but grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. We don't earn our salvation, Jesus Christ earned it for us. So a lot of people confuse the word earning and effort. Right. So again, that verse that I used actually in the New Testament, it says, show the evidence of your salvation by being obedient to God. This is Paul, right? The, the, the whole guy that gave us grace, Paul says, by being obedient to God and fearing him with fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. Fear and trembling. So, you know, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, um, but whoever that said, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So John, right? He wrote the gospel of John, first, second, third John. He also wrote Revelation. And Revelation seems to indicate God means business. Mm -hmm. So you have to have fear of God. And I'm telling you, when you're about ready to commit adultery, you're about ready to lie, you're about ready to cheat, you're about ready to steal. The fear of God's a lot more helpful than the love of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had a woman in our church tell me this when she left her dying husband, her dying husband, because she fell in love with another man. She said, I know God has to forgive me. And I said, you have just crossed a very, very dangerous road. Mm -hmm. And I, I would encourage you for everyone who feels that way, read Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Mm -hmm. God is not a prisoner of grace. That is not who God is. God, God is not, you, you cannot manipulate God. That does not work. Mm -hmm. You might've been able to manipulate your parents, but you cannot manipulate your father in heaven. And so be very careful. Mm -hmm. Be very, very careful when you start using scriptures to tell God what he has to do. Because mm -hmm. that tells me you don't know the God of the scripture. Mm -hmm. You cannot use scripture to manipulate the God of scripture. Yeah. You cannot do it. And uh, just be very, very careful. So, you know, sorry, whoever turned that question yeah, in. Right, I, love hey, you. Yeah. I hope you're still with us. Yeah. That was a lot of good <laughs> stuff just, there. just know, man, you know, sandals, right? Every church leans one way or the other. We, we lean way till, towards love. It's okay every now and then for me to talk a little bit about fear. It's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I don't talk about that nearly enough. And, and we need both. We need to know that God loves us and we need to fear God. Um, right? Yep. So. Okay, we're gonna get one last question before we go. This one comes from Jennifer, who I met at Sandals Church Woodcrest this last weekend when right I was out on. there. Right on. Nice. I was wondering where you were this weekend. Woodcrest. Nice. All right, so Jennifer wrote in, wrote in and said, in this past Sunday's sermon, you quoted Proverbs 19.8, which says, to acquire wisdom is to love yourself. People who cherish understanding will prosper. She says, as someone who is a domestic abuse survivor from a 13-year-long relationship, I struggle with self-love, worth, and esteem. How does acquiring wisdom help us love ourselves in spite of what we've experienced? Yeah, so we have to trust God over our experiences. Mm. That's the answer. Um, you know, and again, that's choosing once again, faith over feelings. So I'm sorry that you're a survivor or I'm glad that you're a survivor, but I'm sorry that you had to survive that. Right, um, right. That's a terrible, terrible thing. And, uh, you know, uh, no woman should ever be afraid by uh, a man. And, 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 you know, guys, you got to understand this. If you're a young man, right, we, we, are, uh, we are emotionally and spiritual equals. We are not physical equals. Guys have 30% more muscle mass. Listen to me. As a man, you have to be meek. You have to do it. 
Um, and, and right, somebody's going to write in because some woman can bench press more than her husband. Okay, that's the exception, not the rule. <laughs> Guys, you have to learn to be gentle. Love is gentle. Love is kind. Love does not demand its own way. So if you're listening to this, you never want this to be your story. The worst thing that can ever happen to intimacy in marriage is when a woman is afraid of the man who says he loves her. That is tragic. Mm-hmm. So, um, right, we should fear God, not our husbands. I don't know why I said our, because I don't have one. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. So, fair enough. Okay, but you know Stephanie. what I mean. But, yeah, I yeah, will fear yeah, God, not my husband. Yeah, yeah, right. So um, so that that's really, really important. So again, the Bible... Wisdom is loving yourself. And so again, the Bible says, fearfully and wonderfully you are made. When God looks at you, he said it was good. You were good. And so you need to agree with God. I am good. I am beautiful. I am worthy of love. You are worthy of love. And and, and that's what's so important is, is God created you to love you and he created you as an object of his love. And so remember, value is determined based upon what someone will pay for it, right? Like we all have ideas in our minds of what, you know, what a, our car is worth or what, our house is worth or what, you know, some antique that grandma gave us. Like we all have these ideas. Look, things are only worth what people will pay for them. What did God pay for you? Mm -hmm. Everything. He sent his one and only son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one thing that God doesn't have another of. Yeah. Right? Jesus, the divine son, he sent him to die for you on the cross. And so um, your ex-husband may have treated you as worthless, but God treated you that you were worth Christ Mm -hmm. and he loves you and he cares for you. And so part of wisdom is trusting, again, not our feelings, because all of us, I think, have days where we feel unloved or we we feel ugly or we feel no good or we feel whatever. And we need to remind ourselves of the truth. God never condemns um, the person, he condemns the action. Don't do that. We should feel bad because that's not who we are. Mm -hmm. I'm a child of God. I'm a princess or I'm I, I'm a prince of the king. I, I'm an heir to the kingdom of God. That's what that means, prince or princess. That's who we are. And so we need to act like nobles because we are nobles. And we should feel sad when we don't act that way. But God calls us worthy. God calls us loved. And, 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 and that's who he feels about us. So my heart goes out to you. And, and again, wisdom is you know, moral strength and mental skill. And you're gonna have to use both of those to understand, because probably you heard some really, really ugly negative things uh, from a man who's a liar. And those words are from Satan and they're not Mm. truth. Mm. You know, I mean, just like, you know, those racist skinheads with, and I didn't listen to what they were saying, but I had no reason to, because everything they're saying is stupid. And, you know, that's what wisdom allows you to do. Wisdom allows you to block foolish things that are said in your direction. Mm. Um, You know, just like, for example, when I was in Hawaii a couple weeks ago, and, and I'm, I'm telling you guys, you, you, you can't know how intense the situation is. I, he, he, bol- he like rushed us like twice, but stopped right in front of us. It was really intimidating. Um, he, he said a lot of things about me. None of them are true. None of them are true. And as I f- could feel myself getting caught up in the emotion of the event, I just like, man, I just need to pray for this guy and walk away mm-hmm. and enjoy my last day in Hawaii. And that's what I did. Pastor Matt, you almost got attacked by a lady with an axe in Hawaii. You got this I guy didn't coming almost at you. get attacked. Well, you did. She yeah, swung it at me. Yeah. She swung yeah, yeah, an axe yeah. at me. Well, okay, you almost got killed by this lady. I'm just wondering, do you think God is telling you yeah. to uh, maybe Okay, literally, not go to so, the, so I have a bunch of family in Hawaii, and the night before, we're all talking about that story. <laughs> oh, really? And this is what my uncle says. Those things just never happen to us. The next morning at 6 a.m., that happened. <laughs> well, my cousin is like, and you know, okay, let me just- You brought it on him. Th- no, this is what I think it is. I think that just like demons were drawn to Jesus, I think evil rears its head when they see God's messenger. I, I can't tell you how many times mm. I have had weird encounters with demonic people. And I think that the core of racism is demons. It is. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It is, right? What are they worshiping? A skin color. Mm-hmm. That's what they're worshiping. Yeah. What? What is that? Yeah. And so what does Romans 1 say? That we've bowed down to created things. What do skinheads, white supremacists, what are they bowing down to? The color of their skin. They're, they're, they've made themselves God. They don't mm-hmm. worship God. They yeah. worship themselves. And that's disgusting, repulsive, and according to a Romans 1, demonic. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. And so I just think that I've had so many weird encounters and I don't know, man, maybe I need to start telling fake stories. So that way God... <laughs> God quits giving me real ones, man. I don't know about that yeah, one. Yeah, I think it's just going to bump up the intensity on your real yeah. ones. So you yeah. have no choice. All right. Well, that's all we've got on the topic of wisdom for this week. But the conversation 
conversation does not have to stop here, guys. If that's you have, all we've got on the on the topic of wisdom. Yeah, that's thesis. it. We, te- we, we ran out. We, we, we officially ran Those out of wisdom at one hour, four minutes. <laughs> we received this week on the topic of wisdom. But if you've got follow-up questions from this episode, if we talked about something today and you want to know more, you want to ask a deeper question, we would love love, love to get those on the show. You can send those in at debrief.show or send us a message on Facebook. However you get those to us, we will get them here on the show because we would love to. Or how continue. about this? If you hated something we said, respond in love. Oh, there you go. That's yeah, good that's practical. Fine. Yeah, Respond in, in one of the best way, one of the yeah, yeah. love. One of the best ways to respond in love, by the way, is to leave us a five-star review in the iTunes mm, store. That's Just true. drop one of those. If you want to find a link to any of that information, all that kind of stuff, or you, Pastor Matt, shared a lot of good Bible verses, those kinds of things. Uh, all that can be online in our show notes at debrief.show slash 75. That's right. And we speaking of 75. A, we should have made a bigger deal about this episode. About Apparently this. someone just dropped off a gift at the office for us in honor of our 75th episode. No Whoa. way. That I can't is one wait to go see this gift. To respond in love. If it's ticking, it's for you. Okay, fair. <laughs> or, if it's, or if it smells delicious, oh, I too will receive it. Hey, great. listen, if you guys want to support uh, the debrief and Sandals Church and all those things, you can either drop off a delicious package at the church office on a Tuesday morning. Just kidding. Uh, if you want to text, give debrief to 951-900-4120. Man, you're not only supporting what we're doing here on this show, but the incredible things that God is trying to do at Sandals Church. And man, oh man, a lot of good things are cooking right now. We have really fun stuff to share with you. Hopefully so, so soon. Um, so we appreciate all of that. Those of you guys who are uh, supporters of Sandal Search from super far away, we love you guys. Also, so we had some like debrief listeners come visit you at Saddleback Church when you were out yeah, there yeah. preaching last week, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. We love you guys. That's right. Debrief Nation. <laughs> I don't know if that, nah, nah, not yeah, a good, I don't not think good, that's going to be a, no. Yeah, wisdom. But you can follow it. us at Debrief Show on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Find some quotes and clips from the show to share with your friends and invite people to listen with you. Share the wisdom, my friends. I think you will not regret it. Mm-hmm. What, what uh, wisdom? Uh, Yoda? Who's the most wise person? Yoda or Gandalf? Oh, mm, he's I don't know. stumped. Yeah. I think it's good. Just a moment of silence and reflection. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can think about that this week. Well, Yoda's fake and Gandalf's real. 